Hello and welcome to the excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. Artificial intelligence has had a revolutionary impact across numerous industries that has been felt across the world. But one industry in particular that could soon be getting an AI-enhanced makeover is global agriculture. AI applications have the potential to usher in a new farming model that not only yields a higher volume of quality product, but also offers a much smaller carbon footprint in terms of resources and the space necessary to deploy them. Vertical farming may provide such a solution by incorporating AI, robotics, and vertically stacked crops in controlled environmental conditions. The vertical farming model might be a game changer in the agriculture sector. Here to help us unpack this and to discuss the potential impacts on farming around the globe, I'm now joined by Hiroki Koga, co-founder and CEO of Oishi, the company behind the world's largest indoor vertical farm. Thanks for coming on the excerpt, Hiroki. Thank you for having us today, Dana. Let's start with the basics. What is vertical farming and where did this idea first originate? Sure. So vertical farming is a new way of growing uh, crops indoors without relying on any external sunlight. So a lot of the times we're inside a warehouse type building. And basically the idea is that we can grow crops anywhere around the world as long as there's access to electricity without being impacted by the outdoor seasonality. This technology itself was first commercialized in Japan probably more than you know, 15, 20 years ago. And so at one point we had probably three to 400 vertical farms commercially operated in Japan, where I'm originally from. But the industry kind of failed because these farms could only grow lettuces and, and leafy greens, which were a commodity. Back then the, the cost of production in vertical farms were very expensive, so they couldn't compete against the outdoor. I know that this wasn't your background farming. What drove you to pursue this technology and to start your company, Oishi? I joined this industry as a consultant, and I've looked at many of those facilities and a lot of them failing. But then in 2015, I came to the U.S. to pursue my master's here in the U.S., and that's right around when vertical farming industry started to take off here in the Western world, primarily driven by the sustainability pressure into this uh, agriculture industry. And vertical farming was thought to be one of the potential solutions as we require significantly less resources compared to conventional farming. So what drove you to pursue this technology and to start your company, Oishi? You know, because I had a lot of experience in this industry in Japan, um, you know, where we've been doing this 10 years before uh, the United States, I had a lot of experience. And at the same time, I realized that uh, there's a huge opportunity here in the United States as um, the, the quality of the crops that I experienced in the United States were not... Uh, you know, to be blunt, as as as, as, as fresh and uh, tasty as what I was used to eating in Japan. And so I thought, you know, if I could grow Japanese quality produce, um, especially things like strawberries or tomatoes, where I saw the biggest gap, quality gap, you know, I thought it would benefit both the consumers here in the U.S., but also as a Japanese, I can share, you know, the culture that I grew up with, with the rest of the world. What are the various ways that your company is integrating AI into your vertical farm? We use AI on a lot of different uh, types of technologies. For example, unlike a traditional farm, because we are um, set up in an industrial uh, setup, we're able to monitor visual data of every single plant in our farms. And also we can also monitor uh, environmental data, like things from temperature, humidity, CO2 levels, all the way to wind speed. So we have this huge, massive, massive um, data asset, which we will run against our AI algorithms that will allow us to analyze what the health condition of the farm is every day. And based on that data, we would either you know, use that data to communicate with our bees, who's in our farm doing all the pollination for us, to really optimize the pollination condition for those bees using, using our AI-driven uh, uh, data, as well as optimize our growing environment or the plants based on all the data um, that we acquire on a day-to-day -day basis. An ongoing concern within the agriculture sector is sustainability. In what ways does the vertical farming model offer a sustainable path forward as the industry grows? Yeah, so when you think about what goes into current agriculture, you need stable weather land, you need access to water, 
need access to labor, and then also use of pesticides. All of these five things were a prerequisite, and they were relatively easy to, to source. But as you can imagine, none of these are you know, easy to source anymore. And as the population is exploding, we just won't have enough land or enough water to you know, keep, keep up with the, with the growing population. And vertical farming, as you can imagine, one, we don't even need farmland. Our current facility used to be a plastic factory that got refurbished into a strawberry farm. We can recycle more than 90% of the water that we use. We don't use any pesticides. We can automate a lot of the processes because we are like a factory set up. We use significantly less resources. And the only thing that we consume more than conventional farming is electricity. But um, with our most recent facility, we have a huge uh, solar power uh, generation right next to our farm. So we're powered by um, clean energy as well there. With the various measures of controlling the environment that virtual farming allows, what sort of advantages does that offer in terms of crop yield? You know, the, the toughest part um, of agriculture these days is is getting the most out of the seeds that you have. And a lot of the times it's the environment that prevents us from maximizing our yield. Sometimes you would have extreme weathers, like you know storms or rain, drought. And these are things that you don't have to worry about in a vertical farm. So you know, as long as you know the perfect growing recipe or the growing environment for each you know, type of crops, then all you have to do is recreate that perfect environment every single day in a vertical farm, which is so much easier to do than in an outdoor farm. And that's what allows us to really maximize the yield and not only yield, but also the quality potential of each uh, genetics um, that these crops have. We've talked about how AI can be applied within the virtual farming infrastructure, but what about the robotics that are doing the manual labor in this equation? How many different robots are employed within a vertical farm? What are the possibilities or what are the responsibilities here? If you can imagine what a car manufacturing factory looks like today versus you know 100 years ago when it was all assembled by human hands, that's kind of the similar process and evolution that we're going through right now with agriculture. So, you know, all the way from seeding the plants to, you know, growing them, controlling the environment uh, automatically, picking the berries, putting them in packages, and, you know, uh, moving the packages to the packaging room, assessing the quality, and then putting onto the trucks. All of this should be automated in, in, in the coming years. For us, at this point, we already have a lot of those uh, procedures automated, including the harvesting component. So we have uh, AI-powered robots that can automatically detect which berries are ripe and ready to go. We still have um, you know, humans in the farm as well, but a lot of our berries are actually already picked by robots at its perfect ripeness. And so they're not even touched by a human hand um, all the way until you know, they're, they're consumed. When will average consumers see fruits and vegetables grown on vertical farms at their local grocery store? And what will that cost look like off the shelf? I would say their cost is, you know, probably somewhere between 30% to, you know, 50%, sometimes, you know, 100% more expensive than conventional products. But I think the benefit that we get is it's usually fresher and the quality is very consistent because most of the time they're they're harvested locally as opposed to, you know, grown in California, shipped all the way to the East Coast, you know, where, where I live. Our products, uh, we have strawberries. And um, because our strawberries are not just any strawberries, but very sweet and, and uh, much higher quality, our cost is a little bit higher. But a pack of our berry um, now goes for approximately $10. So, yes, they're not the cheapest strawberries, but uh, they're, they're flying off the shelves. And I think people are seeing the benefit of our product. Hiroki, is there a way that vertical farming can help alleviate the global health crisis? How do you see this as being a viable solution on such a large scale? Yes, um, I certainly believe that. And the reason is right now the, the, the agriculture uh, supply chain system is, is flawed. And for example, in, in the United States, you know, 90% of the strawberries are grown in California and they're shipped across the country to places like New York. And a lot of the times these strawberries are traveling for you know, more than a week, right? And with vertical farming, we will be able to grow crops anywhere around the world, right next to where consumers live. And yes, they are not the cheapest product today, but um, as you can imagine how you know, computers went from 
you know, a hundred thousand dollars 40, 50 years ago to now, you know, something that's affordable for everyone, just a matter of time that vertical farming will actually become mainstream, especially as our cost is going down very quickly and con- cost of conventional farming is only to go up from here. So it's, it's evident that uh, we will be uh, cheaper and we will also have fresher and higher nutrient products that will be accessible to everyone around the world. What can you tell us about how vertical farming has the potential to increase pollination among bees and boost the bee population? I know you have some IP here that, of course, we respect your right to not divulge. But what can you share with us? I think the biggest limitation in vertical farming up until you know we came in was that people couldn't grow anything beyond leafy greens because most crops beyond leafy greens require bee pollination. But bees were known not to operate well in a sunless vertical farm environment. And so, you know, we spent the last seven years really trying to understand the bee physiology, keeping them happy in our farms and figure out how to make them believe that they're in nature. And with this, um, we should be able to grow pretty much any types of crops. And in a vertical farm, because we can collect data so much more precisely compared to outdoor farms, we're able to collect the health data of every single plant. We're able to collect the health data of the bees and, you know, reconcile those and on a day-to-day basis, readjust, you know, the, the amount of activities that happens in, a, in, in our farm. So in a traditional farm, bee pollination success rate is said to be somewhere around, you know, 60 to 70 percent when it comes to, let's say, Japanese strawberries. But in our farm, our bee pollination success rate is above 95 percent thanks to AI and, um, you know, all the robotics that we have. Then finally, what's next for the future of AI in farming? The speed of and the evolution of AI has been you know, truly surprising to many people, you know, just in the last couple of years alone. You know, we've been able to accomplish pollination success rate going from 60% to 95%, which means our costs went down by, you know, almost 30% just on that pollination part alone. As AI develops and we can integrate AI into a lot of different processes, in addition to just be pollination, but automation of uh, picking, packing, uh, quality assessment, all of these things, I'm, I'm sure that our costs will go down dramatically and it's definitely going to accelerate or help us you know, get to that uh, solving that cost problem much quicker. Hiroki, thank you so much for being on the excerpt. Thank you for having me today, Dana. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.